Hi guys, and uh, welcome to Genetics and Mendelian Inheritance. Alright, so here's the idea. Everything we've been doing, pretty much this whole last exam, has been leading up to this basic concept, to this moment, if you will. The take-home message of all of this has been to get at genetics. All right, and really to understand how inheritance functions with your genes, where those genes came from, how those genes give rise to the way you appear, why our offspring look like us. Like all of it all leads together, these chromosomes and these karyotypes and, and how your karyotype representing a chromosome from mom and a chromosome from dad for all 23 pair of your chromosomes. Uh, how these will uh, come together to fertilize and, and become a zygote, and how that zygote then divides mitotically, mitotic division, uh, to become who you are as a person. All of it. All of it. At the end of the day, it is all about inheritance. All right? It's all about inheritance. It's all about what we call heredity. Okay. So... The father of modern genetics. I love this picture. So, Gregor Mendel, whom is seen here, uh, was born in 1822, 20th of July 1822, died 6th of January 1884, uh, living in the Czech Republic in Austria. Mendel was a monk, and he became incredibly famous for his discoveries in the field of what we now call genetics, way before as a science this existed. And I love this picture because, like, Mendel's hanging out here looking at a part of a pea plant, which is what he used for most of his experimentation. And I feel like everyone else, all these other monks in the picture, are a little irritated with him. Look at, look at, their, look at their faces. Like, these guys are, look at this guy, he's totally over it. Because <laughs> they would not be having their picture taken right now if it wasn't for Gregor Mendel. And I just think it's hilarious. Like, it, it, it gives me some degree of pleasure. So there's Mendel father of modern genetics, a true genius amongst geniuses. Um, so, let, let's let's talk about it. Gregor Mendel it was an Austrian monk. <clears throat> now, what made Mendel uh, probably capable of all this is while he was studying, studying at the University of Vienna, he uh, specialized in science and mathematics. Okay, science and mathematics. That really was the difference maker because Mendel didn't do anything special uh, with these pea plants farming wise. Okay, this is stuff that been doing been being done for years and years and years and years and years. What made Mendel's work interesting, and again, this is 1860s, this was not long ago. Uh, we still have all of his original manuscripts. Like it's you can go and read Mendel's physical handwriting. What made his work so good was he's the first guy that really applied mathematics and the statistical concept of probability to his work. All right, Mendel is really like the first biostatistician, and because of this, that is why his work is special. He had predictive power over how genetics would play out, and when he ran the numbers, <laughs> he, he was accurate. He was incredibly accurate. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say here? So he used pea plants, Pisum sativum. Now, this is fascinating. All of his work played out so well. It's neat that this happened because, again, this was the 1860s, though it wasn't that long ago. People at the time still had no idea what cells were. Uh, we were still not functioning off of the concepts of germ theory in any realistic way. Nobody had a clue what DNA was, how chromosomes worked, or any real genetic concepts. Mendel never looked at a microscope in all of his days. All of this, all of what he came up with, uh, was based off of mathematical probabilities, statistical analysis. So. Mendel's capacity for statistical analysis is what separated him from other scientific professionals. All right. Um, let's see. He was a school teacher for a while. That's kind of neat. What else do we want to say? Okay, let's, let's jump down here. So at the time, the concept of inheritance was thought of as being the blending hypothesis. Like, you know when I say cell theory, this is how cells work. Well, at the time, people thought that inheritance functioned off of what was commonly referred to as the blending hypothesis. Okay, the blending hypothesis. Now, the blending hypothesis of inheritance basically stated that, um... 
if I'm very tall and my wife is very short, then our offspring should be a blend of that trait and be roughly medium height. And that seems logical, which is why it took hold at the time. It's very logical. If a person with very dark complexion has a child with a person with very light complexion, you'd expect their complexion to be somewhere in the middle. Wow, that makes perfect sense. You know, it, this is just how this goes, a, a blending concept of inheritance. But now we recognize that that is complete and utter garbage. It violates all evolutionary concepts. Again, put forth by Charles Darwin. Now, these are three very important people in the fields of science, all of which were doing their work at the same time. Here's Mendel, our geneticist. Here's Darwin, our evolutionary scientist. And for the life of me at the moment, I can't remember what Verkal was doing, but I believe he was formulating cell theories based concepts. All at the same time, these radicals of science. Now, the reason the blending hypothesis doesn't work is uh, very straightforward. Sometimes you don't get the uh, the blend that we were just talking about. A very tall person and a very short person could have a child, and that child could be really tall, or alternatively could be really short, or maybe uh, you know someone that's very tall and neither of their parents is very tall. Like there's all sorts of violations to the concept of blending because it doesn't make any sense in terms of the way the science works on inheritance. It doesn't work. Okay, the blending concept doesn't work. Even very simplistic things, like one of Mendel's very early experiments, was taking uh, pink flowered pea plants and breeding them to one another, and their offspring, some were white, and some were pink, and some were red. That, like, these are not blends of these. There was something else clearly happening. In fact, Mendel realized this very early on, and he decided to call what he was doing the particulate theory of inheritance. All right? He would say that inside of these plants there are particles, and that those particles are passed to those plants' as offspring, and ergo those plants have offspring that represent either a blend of those particles, or one or the other of those particles. Particles that we now know are genes, okay? We now recognize that what he was doing in reality was referring to chromosomes and meiotic division, sexual reproduction, and the ascribed genes and their representative alleles of the time. He had no idea how all of this worked, but via mathematical formulation came up with all of the base concepts that now uh, genetics is like founded upon, all right? And his two main proposals, okay, these two main things were as follows. One, the law of segregation and the law of independent assortment. These are the base concepts for how meiotic sexual uh, reproduction takes place, how divisions work, how genetics functions. Okay, segregation and independent assortment. Segregation and independent assortment. Uh, let's see. Now, the garden pea was a wonderful plant. Like, where do you put this? you got to put it somewhere. The garden pea, garden pea was a wonderful plant for his experimentation for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it was very easy to grow pea plants, or like weeds that just grow wherever you put them. Uh, they grow very quickly and then reproduce very quickly. They have what we call a short generation time. Um, these pea plants, if you separate them off a single plant by itself, it can self-pollinate, or alternatively, you can do a little bit of work to them, and you can cross-pollinate one with another. Like, you can keep them quite separate and breed one to the next and have offspring from those two, and then on down the line it goes. Um, let's see, what else do I want to say here? Okay. Mendel had access to true breeding varieties, so you could go down to a, a seed storage area and get seeds that would only ever produce tall plants. Get seeds that would only ever produce short plants. Seeds that would only ever produce yellow seeds. Or, uh, yeah, that'll do, seeds. Or green by comparison, or, or what have you. Like, he could go and get true breeding varieties. And incredibly lucky for Mendel and his experimentation, pretty much all of the traits he was looking at were controlled by individual genes. So the pea plant would have a gene for seed shape, a gene for height, all right? Very lucky, because that is almost never the case where you have one gene controlling one trait. Like us 
and uh, hair color or something along those lines. There are genes all over our genetic code that determine sort of their hair, hair's texture, uh, how quickly or how much of it grows and its color. Like there are endless genes that regulate all of this. So it was very, very fortunate for Mendel that he picked this particular plant, one of those random miracles in science, uh, and thus was capable of running these genetic tests and having no mud in his data. The, the data was very clean. All right, this guy here is Reginald Punnett. You need to be friends with him as we progress, because as we go through this, we're going to be talking at length about something you've already heard of called Punnett squares. All right, the Punnett square, that is a Punnett square. This is a Punnett square. You'll be doing Punnett squares on your uh, final exam. I guarantee it. Like, these Punnett squares are very important. What they do is they allow us to uh, statistically analyze potentials for offspring uh, based off of what we know about the parents, okay, the mother and the father. So, genotype versus phenotype. This is a very important term set you need to be friends with. A genotype is the genetics of an organism, okay, the alleles present in that organism's DNA for a given trait or for the organism as a whole. So, you have a genotype which is uh, then going to give rise to your phenotype, all right? You see how we use this terminology? A genotype is the alleles, the genes that you physically contain, whereas the phenotype is the expression of those alleles. I'm, my, my son's outside the door. Um, so, where am I at? All right, genotypes. So, sometimes for a given gene, like if we look at a chromosome pairing, like a chromosome from mom and a chromosome from dad. Sometimes you get the exact same allele for a gene, and again, an allele for a gene is a variant of that gene. Sometimes you get the exact same allele for that gene from mom as you do from dad, and if mom and dad both give you the identical same allele for a gene, you are thought of as being homozygous. Homozygous. As a zygote, you have the same alleles for a given gene. Okay, homozygous, you have two identical alleles for a gene versus being heterozygous. Hetero means different. Heterozygous means you have two different alleles for a gene. Like if, if you look here, perhaps let's say that uh, to have brown eyes, you get a gene from mom. And again, this is not reality. We're just playing games here. Uh, perhaps you get a gene from mom for brown eyes, which is a big B represented here. That would be like a big B down there. And then from dad, you also get a big B. That would be a big B down there. So two identical alleles. That means you get two identical alleles. You're going to have brown eyes. That is being homozygous for that trait, for brown eyes. Uh, alternatively, you could be heterozygous. Maybe you get a gene for brown eyes and then a little b is for blue eyes. You get a gene for blue eyes. Well, if you got a big B and a little b in our Punnett square here, that would mean that you are heterozygous. They are different. See, that is different from this. That is heterozygous. Whereas here, these are the same allele from mom, allele from dad, identical. That is homozygous. Okay, homozygous versus heterozygous. And again, this is part of your genotype. The phenotype, the phenotype refers to your, uh, the, the way that these genes are expressed to give rise to the way you appear. Your phenotype is how you look, how, how your system works in reality. Um, it refers to the physical appearance of the individual or, or really how things function. Okay, that is also phenotypic. Uh, now, in this, there are two very, very important terms that we have to broach. And those terms are dominance and recessive in terms of alleles. Dominant alleles versus recessive alleles. The way this works is as follows. Dominant alleles will always be expressed, no matter what. If you get a dominant allele from mom and you don't get it from dad, you're going to display a dominant phenotype. You're going to display a dominant phenotype. Like, for instance, perhaps in our Punnett square here, brown eyes, that big B, okay, get the big B down here, that big B is a dominant allele. It will always be expressed. If it's in the genotype, it's going to be expressed. So if you get one from mom and one from dad, you got brown eyes. But if you get one from mom and dad gives you a blue eye gene, well, hey, guess what? You're still going to have brown eyes because it's a dominant trait. If mom gives you 
a little b and that gives you a big b you still got brown eyes it doesn't matter if you're homozygous or heterozygous if you have the dominant trait you will express that dominant phenotype period the end all right the only time there will be variation is if you get a pair of recessive traits mom gives you a gene for blue eyes dad gives you a gene for blue eyes then there is no dominant trait in play here you have two recessive traits that would mean that you are homozygous recessive that means that you have blue eyes all right homozygous recessive homozygous recessive you have two identical recessive genes your genotype would be homozygous recessive that means that your phenotype is you have blue eyes Do you guys see how that term set is used in other words you could be homozygous dominant and your phenotype would be brown eyes. You could be heterozygous dominant, and your phenotype would be brown eyes. But if you're homozygous recessive, your phenotype is to have blue eyes. I would listen to that three or four times. Okay, that is very very important. Um, what else do we want to say here? So these genes that have variations in alleles will always be found at a specific spot on a chromosome. So if a gene for eye color is found here on the mom chromosome, the same uh, basic genetic determinants factor, so a gene for eye color, will be found on the opposing dad chromosome at the same spot. And when I say at the same spot, we call this a locus, okay? A locus is an area on a uh, chromosome which will tend to have one allele or another for a given gene. So we don't say this spot or that spot, we say this locus or that locus. Or a uh, plural would be loci, these loci, all right? Boy, that's a lot. All right, good, let's go here. Uh, the laws, okay, so moving on to Mendelian laws. <clears throat> Remember there are two, the law of segregation seen here, and the law of independent assortment as seen here. Now, this is actually very easy and straightforward, but people get so freaking confused. Let me just try to lay this out there for you as best I can. The law of segregation, I'll read it to you and then tell you how it works. Each individual has a pair of factors that will be alleles, alternate forms of a gene, for a given trait. Okay, each individual has a pair of alleles for a given trait. Doesn't matter. One from mom, one from dad, this plant's tall, two big T's. One from mom, one from dad, this plant's short, it's got two little T's. That will make it homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant. We all have a chromosome from mom and a chromosome from dad for each of our 23 spots, all right? Our 23 chromosomes. Pairs, 23 pairs. Um, these factors, these alleles, will segregate, the law of segregation, separately during sperm and egg uh, formation. Okay, they segregate separately during meiotic division. So this plant with a big T and a big T, only one of those is going to continue down to become a sperm. Only one of these is going to continue down to become an egg. It will, one will go and one will not. So uh, when you make sperm and egg, depending upon what it is, if you have uh, this chromosomal pairing from your mom and then from your dad, one of these will go and the other will remain behind. This is the law of segregation, okay? Each gamete contains only one factor or allele from a given pair of factors. Um, and what that basically indicates is that your offspring will uh, not be genetically identical to you in most cases. Now, there's a little more to this because of the process of crossing over, but we're, we're just gonna leave that for time being. Now, now. The law of independent assortment states that, well, hang on, let me just read to you and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, the pair of factors for one trait segregate independently of the factors from other traits. All possible combination of factors can occur in the gametes. Now, what this means is, well, hang on, let's just do this together. The law of segregation means that if you have two chromosomes, one will go into an offspring, uh, whereas the other one will go elsewhere. Okay, a sperm or an egg will only have one of your chromosomes for a given pair. That is the law of segregation. One will go, the other will remain. Whereas in independent assortment, what this means is that the genes for eye color have no bearing upon the genes for height. Okay, they're all independent of one another. 
Uh, basically, let me just jump way on back again. What this really means is, for chromosome pairing 1, if the mom gene goes into a gamete, it has no bearing on chromosome pairing 2. It has no bearing on chromosome pairing 3. If uh, the offspring is male and gets a Y chromosome from this male individual, that has no bearing on which chromosome from chromosome 15 travels. That has no bearing on which chromosome from chromosome 9 travels. All of these chromosomes separate independently of one another. Okay, they're all independent. That is the law of independent assortment. Your chromosomes will assort themselves independently of one another into your gametes, which could then go on for sexual reproduction, uh, formation of the zygote. So that's how this works, all right? That's how this works. Uh, law of segregation, that means that they, your individual chromosomes, like your two chromosomes for pairing one, uh, they will separate for meiotic division, and the law of independent assortment, that which chromosome for chromosome 1 goes has no bearing over chromosome 2 or 3 or 4 or what have you. Independent assortment versus the law of segregation. Perfect. That's perfect. That will work just fine. Um, let's see. Do I need to talk about Punnett squares here? Okay, the idea behind a Punnett square, let me just lay this on you. I, I, like, I feel like you should know what Punnett squares are at this stage. Like, I feel like you've probably done a bunch of them, but in the event that you have not, uh, the Punnett square, what this does is it allows us to take an individual, like a, a let's call this the mom flower and the dad flower. Let's say that it, it allows us to take an individual that's like the mom flower here. We know her uh, genotype and thus, or let me rephrase, we know her phenotype and thus her genotype. In this particular case, for uh, flower color, her flower color is white, whereas the dad flower here, his flower color is red. And we know what genetics this represents. Because we know what genetics this represents, we know the uh, genetics, the genotypes of their offspring. We know that they will all be um, heterozygous dominant phenotype. And the essence of this is it allows us to, be, uh, to have predictive power over what the offspring will look like. And knowing this, it would then give us predictive power over what the offspring would look like if these two plants were to breed together. As shown here, we know that their offspring would be white, red, and pink. And we know what percentages of that would take place. So that's what a Punnett square does for us. It gives us predictive power. Uh, knowing the genotypes of parents or offspring gives us predictive power over what their genotypes represent. So knowing their phenotypes, it gives us predictive power over understanding their genotypes. That'll work. That'll work. All right, uh, the basic experiment. So uh, what Mendel did was he did uh, crossbreeding experiments. He used true breeding, that would be homozygous plants, um, and analyzed individual traits, one at the time, and then basically built Punnett squares of his own time prior to the formation of this very exacting science. So let's say we take... Um, a mom plant that has two, or let me rephrase, we take a mom plant that's tall and every time this plant crossbreeds with itself it's always tall. There's never been a short plant in the lineage of this plant. We know that it is true breeding, it is homozygous dominant for being tall. That's two big T's. By comparison, we crossbreed that with a plant that is short. And to be short, we know that it has to be homozygous recessive. It's going to have two little t's. So, let me just do this for you. We have a Punnett square. Okay? This is what you got to do on your test. I will describe to you what's happening, and you got to write it out. What you'll do is you'll say, okay, we got mom, and up here would have to be dad, but I don't have space. Okay? Mom is... Um, let's say tall and she's true breeding so we got a big T and a big T. Dad is short and true breeding so he's got a little T and a little T. When these cross breed with one another what we end up with is a situation like this. Big T, little T. Big T, little T. You guys see where I'm going here? Big T, little t, big T, little t. So the test question I would ask is this. 
what is the genotype of mom in this situation? Uh, mom's genotype is homozygous dominant. I would say, what is mom's phenotype? Mom is tall. I would say, what percentage of their offspring would you expect to be tall? You would expect 100% of their offspring to be tall, because the big T is what? A dominant trait. It's a dominant trait. When it's there, it masks everything else. So they all have a big T, so they will all be tall. Now, what if we take two individuals from this and breed those with one another? Let's just back it straight on up here. Well, that would mean that the mom has a big T and a little T, and the dad has... Oh, wait. Hang on. I totally messed that up. That would mean that mom has a big T and a little T, and the dad has a big T and a little T. Because these are the offspring of the previous generation. This would be an F2 cross. Alright, so what we do is we got a big T there and a big T there. Alright, there's one. Got a big T there, big T, and a little T there. There's a little T. A uh, big T there and a little T there and a little T there and a little T there. So what do we end up with? You would expect Probability wise, 25% of your plants to be homozygous dominant for height being tall, 50% of your plants to be phenotypically tall but be homozygous. I'm sorry, that's wrong. You'd expect 50% of your plants to, to here be tall and thus uh, be heterozygous dominant. They display a dominant phenotype, but they are heterozygous. And then you'd expect 25% of your plants to be short and homozygous recessive. So the test question would say, uh, what percentage of your plants would be short? 25%. What percentage of your plants would be tall? 75%. What percentage of your plants would be heterozygous? 50%. That's what we expect. That's what a Punnett square does. A Punnett square gives us predictive power. Alright? A Punnett square gives us predictive power to be able to guess what happens next in terms of uh, these what we call monohybrid crosses. Monohybrid crosses when we uh, examine one trait at a time as seen here for height. And which is pretty much what Mendel was doing. Now, that is to say that we can also do what are called dihybrid crosses. Dihybrid crosses is when we test more than one trait at a time and we can do that. It's not that complicated, but for us, I'm just not worried about dihybrid crosses. It's not something I'm terribly concerned with. In fact, this can get very chancy. Right? Sometimes uh, you can have many, many traits all being examined at the same time. Lots of different percentages being thrown around. This can get very complicated very fast. We are not going to be doing that. We are going to stick to monohybrid crosses so that we can get our point across and be done with it. Okay? Uh, you can expect on your exam me to only do monohybrid crosses. You can expect on your homework assignments, your quizzes and things on, on Canvas, you can expect only monohybrid crosses. Yeah. Perfect. All right, scientific application. So, uh, one of the neat things we can do is by understanding what the offspring of a plant looks like or the offspring of an individual looks like, uh, we can do a test cross. The idea is we can do this test cross to determine the uh, genotypes of the individuals based off of what we see. And what I find fascinating about this is by looking at the offspring to then interpret uh, the, the genotype of the parental um, generation. Okay, so let me give you a for instance. I've kind of changed this slide a little bit to make it better, so just bear with me. We know that we have a tall plant and a... Sh let me rephrase, let me change this. We know that we've got a tall plant and a short plant, and we're going to breed those together. That's all we know. One's short and one's tall. Now, if it's short, we know with absolute certainty that it's going to be homozygous recessive. It's got to be two little t's if it's short. That's homozygous recessive. But if the plant's tall, that just means that it displays a dominant phenotype. It could be homozygous or it could be heterozygous. We don't know. We know that it's got one tall gene, but we don't know 
what the other one is. We don't know if it's homozygous or heterozygous. So what do we, so what do, we do? We crossbreed them. We, know, we crossbreed this short plant with the tall plant. And look at what we get. Tall plant, tall plant, tall plant, short plant. With this sort of distribution, because we got a short plant out of this, we know with absolute certainty that this male side of things here has to be heterozygous. That's got to be a little t. Because for this plant to get two recessive genes, this has to be a recessive gene. We know that our tall plant that we started with is in fact heterozygous. It's heterozygous. Displays the dominant phenotype, but has a recessive gene in its genotype. Perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to tell you. Perfect. All right. We do test crosses to find out. You can guarantee that you're going to see stuff like this on your test. I think it's very fascinating. I think it's incredibly functional and useful, especially in genetic research. Man, this is so important. So uh, I think it's important that you understand it. All right, perfect. And, and you can guarantee that I'll be giving you homework or, again, online quizzes that will help you get through this and work through it multiple times. The only way to really learn it is to work through it a bunch of times, and uh, it'll work for you. Now then, moving on beyond basic Mendelian inheritance, okay? There is more to genetics than dominance and recessive and basic genotype and phenotype Punnett squares of this fashion. There is, in fact, way, way more going on. Now, what you see here is a brief primer on the next multitude of slides, okay? A brief primer on the next multitude of slides. So I'm going to read through these very quickly, uh, lay their basic concepts on you, and then we're going to go part by part and examine them in detail. Sometimes you'll have what are called multiple alleles for a trait. Multiple alleles. A gene that exists in several allelic forms in a population. It's not just tall, it's not just short. Maybe there's more to it. Maybe there's really tall, tall, kind of medium, short, and really short. Maybe there's a lot of different alleles out there for a given gene. That would be a multi-allelic trait. Okay, a multiple allele trait. Blood typing is like that. A's, B's, neither. It's variation. Okay, sometimes you're AB, sometimes you got nothing. That is a multi-allelic trait. Codominance is where more than one allele gets expressed simultaneously. Simultaneously. Uh, and, and I'll be showing you some good pictures on that. I, I don't want to complicate it just yet. But the idea is that the organism expresses a pair of dominant alleles simultaneously. Simultaneously. So there's more than one dominant allele, you might say. Incomplete dominance. Uh, when the heterozygote has an intermediate phenotype between either homozygote. Now, what the heck does that mean? That's your blending theory of inheritance. That would be a red flower breeding with a, a white flower and producing a pink flower as a result. Incomplete dominance. Uh, neither one is in control. They have an intermediate phenotype that represents both parents. All right, pleiotrophy. When a single mutant gene affects two or more really different traits in a lot of cases. Okay, one alteration affects lots of things all over the body. Epistasis, where one gene at one locus can override the expression of other genes at other loci. When that gene is there, it completely changes how the whole organism works. All right, everything changes as a result of one gene as opposed to another. And then last but not least, polygenetic, inherit uh, polygenetic inheritance. One trait is governed by lots of alleles. you got one trait and many alleles from all over the karyotype influence that single allele. So let's go through and talk about these in detail. Multiple alleles. Uh, uh, you can't really get any better than blood types, okay? Uh, there are more than one, or I'm sorry, more than two different alleles for a trait that it would make it a multi-allelic trait. It could be A can be B, can be AB, can be O. There's more out there than just one or the other. Then there's codominance. Now, ABO blood type also is an example of that, but I think this cow is better. This cow got a dominant gene to have white fur and a dominant gene to have brown fur. So what happened? Well, 
The cow displays both white fur and brown fur. That's codominance. They are both expressed simultaneously. They, the cow displays both dominant traits, traits at the exact same time. All right? Codominance. That is codominance. More than one allele is fully expressed. Incomplete dominance. Red flower and white flower come together to make pink flowers. Uh, this is where the offspring represent a, uh, a blend, if you will, of the two parents. Uh, heterozygote has a phenotype intermediate between that of either homozygote. Tall person has a child with a short person. The offspring is of medium height. That would be an example of incomplete dominance. Not reality for humans, but good enough for our purposes in conversation here. Pleiotrophy. When, it <clears throat> when a single mutant gene affects two or more distinct and seemingly unrelated traits. A good example of this is albinism. All right, You have a uh, single genetic alteration, a single mutant gene that causes the body to not be able to produce uh, a pigment in this particular case, and that changes the way that the uh, feathers develop, that changes the way that pain is felt by the organism, that changes the way the eyes function with the organism, changes stuff all over the place. That's a pleiotrophic trait. When a single gene, a single mutant gene affects two or more really different traits. That is, that's a good example of this. Uh, epistasis, where one gene, if it's there, overrides the expression of other genes. Now, this, these are going to seem similar, but I assure you they're quite different. In the realm of the amazing Labrador Retriever, there are three major color variants. There are black labs, what are called chocolate labs, and yellow labs. Black, chocolate, and yellow. The reality is, and bear with me here, the reality is that there are only two color genes for Labrador Retrievers. You can be a black lab or you can be a brown lab. That's all there is. There is no other gene for color on these. You're either black or brown. But there is a weird variant of the gene that allows for the production of melanin, which is the pigment that allows them to be black or brown. Okay? And regardless of your other genetics, if you get the mutant allele and you don't produce melanin in the same way, well, guess what? You're going to be a yellow lab. Okay? So you can have the gene for black fur, but if you don't have the right gene for melanin, you're going to be a yellow lab. You can have the gene for brown fur, but if you don't have the right gene for melanin, you're going to be a yellow lab. When this gene is present, it overrides the others. Okay? That is an epistatic gene. Polygenic uh, occurs when a trait is governed by two or more sets of alleles. Each dominant allele has a quantitative or additive effect upon the phenotype. That is how human skin coloration functions. we got genes all over our uh, karyotype that lead to our skin coloration. And that's why there's so much crazy variety in skin coloration. Because all of these genes work together to lead to the amount of melanin that we produce. Okay? That is a polygenic trait where there are lots of genes all over your karyotype that lead towards a single trait like coloration of the skin. Perfect. Um, now a few other concepts to get into here. Inheritance and human disease. Uh, worthy of mention here is the concept of autosomes and sex chromosomes. Your first 22 chromosomal pairs are considered your autosomes. So the first 22, 1 through 22, those are autosomes. The sex chromosomes are the last two. And I feel like I mentioned this in the last lecture, but regardless, we're going to talk about it again. So a, nine, or a good example of an autosomal dominant uh, what we would consider a disease, disease being a strong word here, is something like polydactyly. I'll give you a second to look at this hand and tell me what's the matter. Do you see it? Pause the tape, because I'm fixing to talk about it. If you look, there's the thumb, and there's a pointer finger, your middle finger, your ring finger, your pinky finger, and then another one. Poly Polydactyly means multi-fingers. Polydactyly is a genetically dominant trait. 
If that trait is present, you get it from mom, you get it from dad, doesn't matter. You're going to have more than one finger. Uh, extra finger, I should say. You're going to have extra fingers. Sometimes these are those little pieces that stick out, and sometimes they're full-fledged fingers, like two or three extras. Okay? Uh, this is a autosomal dominant, let's call it disease. Okay? Not really a disease, but you get my point. This is a good way of getting at genetics here. It's an autosomal dominant trait. Um, seen in the autosomes, and when it's present, it is always expressed. There are also uh, autosomal recessive traits. And sickle cell is a really good example of this. Do I have sickle cell on here any place? Regardless, sickle cell is a really good example of this. It's an autosomal trait, and um, you will only express the bad parts of sickle cell uh, when you get both recessive genes, from one from mom, one from dad. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's basically what they're showing you here. So that is a, a good example of an autosomal recessive disease uh, where it's in the autosomes, the, the chromosomes for um, sickle cell are in the autosomes in the first 22 pairings and you got to get the recessive trait from mom and the recessive trait from dad to have the disease. Okay, that is an autosomal recessive trait. By comparison, there are also X-linked traits. Okay, X-linked is what we call these. We say they're X-linked or sex-linked. This is because they deal only with the X and Y chromosomes. These are the sex chromosomes. Um, what do I want to say? I feel like we've already kind of talked about this. A good example of this is hemophilia. That, and, and I know we talked about this, but the, the idea is that... Um, the genes for blood clotting are found only on the X chromosome. Okay, only the X chromosome. Only the X chromosome displays the trait for um, blood clotting. Alternatively, only the X chromosome has the uh, required genetics for appropriate color vision. I think I've got a slide on this. Yes, okay. Um, so, let's do this one first. You have, if you're a female, you get two chances, okay? A female gets two chances, two X chromosomes in a female, to get the appropriate genetics for blood clotting. So it's very rare for a female to uh, be hemophiliac. Whereas a male, you only get one X chromosome, so your chance of getting the bad X chromosome is vastly increased, okay? Um, so hemophilia, hemophilia is X-linked, it's X-linked, just like color vision. Um, you probably realize that males are way more likely to have problems with color vision uh, or what we call color blindness than are females. It's super rare for a female to be color blind, uh, whereas males displaying some degree of color blindness, seeing the number 74 here, for example, folks, uh, it's way more likely for males to be color blind. Uh, that's because it travels on the X chromosome, and females get two copies of the X chromosome, which means they get two chances for the appropriate genetics for color vision, whereas males only get one X chromosome, which means they only get one shot at the appropriate genetics for color vision. Okay, color blindness, muscular dystrophy, hemophilia, they're all X-linked. And there are also, there's also the possibility of having environmental effects uh, to genetics and phenotypic expression of those genetics. Cleft lips, club foot, uh, hypertension, diabetes, schizophrenia, allergies, cancer are all multifactorial uh, factorial traits. They're all over the place, Com uh, controlled by polygenic inheritance, but they are acted upon by environmental cues to drive development of those issues. All right, some folks are just predisposed to diabetes. Some folks are just predisposed to hypertension. That's why it's so important when you go to the doctor, they ask you about your family history. They're trying to find out if you're predisposed towards these conditions so they can monitor them. All right? Environmental influences will bring these about. Right? It's, it functions. Now, one of my favorite examples of an environmental trait and the expression of a uh, genotype, or let me rephrase, a phenotype being the expression of the genotype is a Himalayan rabbit. I think they're just super cool. Uh, these rabbits are white, and the areas of their body that get very cold, the colder the area the body gets, the more melanin gets expressed in those areas. So the environment causes an augmentation of the phenotype 
based off availability in the genotype. That's an environmental effect. So you can expect the ears of a rabbit in a very cold environment to get very cold. So they become very dark. The idea there is that they would absorb more heat from the sun and warm up more easily. The legs, the nose, that's how this works, man. The environment affects the expression of the genotype as a specific phenotype. Same thing with all of these, right? Same thing. And uh, I think that's the end. So what I want to say is, here's our, our guy. This is Gregor Mendel, worthy of our praise. So uh, thank you, Gregor, for all of your amazing work. Here's some of his original writings. You can see him working statistics in the borders. And that is fantastic. That's the guy right there. Um, now, there are other slides on this PowerPoint. I threw one up with uh, hemophilia and the European royal family. You can see it going all the way from Victoria up through Prince Henry and William over here. Um, I put up a picture of a Punnett square just so you can realize that we're doing these on our exams. And I've given you a little bit of a practice test on the Punnett square. I think some of these are pretty weird. I think I worded it very strangely. So don't stress too much if you're a little confused. Um, I will be putting up a quiz, and as long as you can work through that quiz, hey man, we're doing just fine. So that is the extent of our conversation on genetics. You can expect me to be putting up a quiz on genetics pretty soon. I hope to get to it today. And uh, yeah, that's that. All right, so thank you so much. And study hard, work hard. You can be expecting a lab test coming up pretty soon, final. All right, thanks guys.